Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. We're here today with Aaron Kraft, the Weatherization Program Coordinator for Washtenaw County. We'll be talking about the importance of weatherization for everyone, but especially for low-income homeowners. Aaron, welcome to the show. We're really pleased to have you here today. Thanks, Barbara. Glad to be here. Weatherization is a term that I used to think referred to getting your home ready for the winter, but I know now it encompasses a whole lot more. Can you give us an overview of what that term means? Yeah, energy uh, efficiency is what I think of when I say weatherization, and it can apply to many different seasons, not just winter. It can be a, a year-round improvement that you can make to your house. All for lowering your utility bills. Right. Yep. And what are the services that the Washtenaw County program provides? Uh, basically, the Washtenaw County Weatherization Program um, starts off with a home inspection, an energy audit, one might say, and we go in and we do a, a top to bottom inspection of the home to try to find out where you might be losing energy around the house. Uh, the inspector will then uh, create a work order for one of our contractors, and then they'll come in and do the, do the improvements, and then after the work is done, we come back one more time to inspect the work, do a couple final tests, and that in a nutshell is the Weatherization Program. Sounds great. So oh, and I should, I should also mention it's uh, entirely free. Oh, the wow. The program's free. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the inspectors sound like they have a lot of responsibility. Do they need special training to do this? Yes. Uh, um, the state of Michigan, which operates the weatherization program, has uh, a s an weatherization inspector certification that's required for any of our inspectors. So they're well trained. Hmm. And how can people find out if they're eligible for your services? Uh, the easiest way is to uh, give our program a call. Our phone number is 734-544-2948, or you can find us on the Washtenaw County website, which is uh, ewashtenaw.org slash weatherization. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that weatherization can be one of the most effective ways to help a family with their utility bills. Now, why is that? Um, a real good answer is that the weatherization improvements uh, last for the life of the house. So they're always working. Your attic insulation, if you install new attic insulation, never turns off, never stops working. It's a permanent fix that can help save you money year after year. And the Recovery Act of 2009, otherwise known as the Stimulus Bill, has a lot of weatherization funding. Now, is this a new thing that the federal government's helping us with the weatherization funds? Well, the, the weatherization program has been around since 1976, mm -hmm. and Washtenaw County has operated it for about that length of time. So the program itself isn't new. Um, the recovery funding has uh, enabled us to do a great deal more weatherization in the community than previously. Um, for 2010 and 2011, we were hoping to weatherize a, a, around or over 400 homes each year. And how many did you do usually before the uh, stimulus funding? Yeah, historically we were about 100 homes a year, so it's quite a, quite a jump for us. Mm -hmm. And is this roughly about how many people need it, or are there a lot more out there? Yeah, probably not. It's, it's, there's a great need for energy improvements, such as the ones that we complete in the weatherization program. I would say just about any house, unless it's just recently built to very high standards, could use some weatherization. And I recently read a statistic that uh, one of five American children live under the poverty line. And in the Detroit area, it's as much as one in three. So that represents an awful lot of people who could be having trouble um, paying their utility bills. What proportion would you say of a um, household income would utility bills represent? Um, say for a typical client for the weatherization program, uh, the the income level for a person at the poverty line, say their household is the size of four, a four-person household, that's $22,000. If they make more than that, they're not considered to be in poverty, less they're included in that statistic. So an average three-bedroom ranch might have $1,800, $2,000 per year for their uh, utility costs. That's 10% of their take-home pay. It's quite burdensome and happens year after year. So if we can reduce that, it can improve their um, situation. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I'm sure that you can't do all the upgrades that you'd like every time you go into a home, and so maybe we could discuss the upgrades that have the fastest payback, the ones you do most commonly. Which one would you consider to be the one that um, most commonly is needed in each home? Attic insulation oh. and insulation in general would be the, attic insulation has the pa fastest payback period and it's the easiest one for us to get excited about and tell the homeowner, you're really going to save some money if we're able to do this. 
And what kind of insulation do you usually use in attics? Uh, our standard uh, insulation is, is blown cellulose insulation, which is basically chopped up newspaper. Hmm. So you're recycling as well. Yes, uh, it's, it's a nice recycled product. It doesn't take a lot of energy to create the insulation, unlike some other products. And you hear a lot about the R value that's recommended. What, what is R value? Um, R value is basically just the measure of a material's uh, ability to prevent heat transfer. So if you put your hand up against a window, say, you know that window is very cold, ice cold, and that's because it has a low R value. If you put your hand right next to the window on the wall that's nicely insulated, um, you feel a warm wall because it has a higher R value associated with it. And what would you recommend uh, as an R value for an attic? In our climate, R30 or R40 would be a really nice number to achieve, and that's what we generally strive for. And about how thick is that? Um, around 12 inches. Mm -hmm. yeah, about a foot. And would you say that most homes have um, pretty close to that? Uh, probably not. Um, if, if, if I could say average, maybe six, something along those lines. But almost every home we can find to add some attic insulation. Um, and if somebody can't, um, if somebody isn't eligible for this because they don't meet your income levels, can they do attic insulation on their own? Attic, attic insulation is a doable do-it-yourself project, I would say. Um, you can go to a hardware store. If you have like a thousand square foot house, it's probably th around $300, maybe a little more for uh, cellulose insulation. And then you buy the insulation there and oftentimes they'll rent you the machine that, that has the tube that blows it up in there for free. So it's, a, it's an afternoon project, and uh, borrow your cousin's pickup truck, and you're on your way. So how many years would you consider the payback on the average home um, doing attic insulation? It's, it's quite short, uh, three to seven years, depending on what you already have in there, how much you install, how much it costs. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty reasonable. So if the payback's so fast and it's so easy to do, why do you think more people aren't doing it? And the short answer is just out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize how much of an impact that can make on your utility bills or even on your comfort level. Um, it's just, just something people don't think about as much as one would imagine. So with wall insulation, does a family have to move the furniture so that you can get at it and repaint and all that? Um, not usually. It's 90% of the time our contractors can remove a little bit of siding or drill holes in the exterior. So it's pretty low invasive, although it's not as much of a do-it-yourself project as attic insulation is. Okay, so we have attics, walls. What would be your third most common upgrade? Uh, the third most energy efficient, p easy payback upgrade would be air sealing. So just tightening up the house, let it, stopping the air exchange from inside to out. Okay. And in the movie we're going to be showing in a few minutes, there's a um, blower door test. And maybe you could tell us how that helps people find the air leaks in their homes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the blower door test is basically a fan that you install in the door. You seal off a door, put a fan in it, and you depressurize the house so that you can walk around the house and feel air leaks through your windows or walls or cracks in the structure. And it gives us a good sense of whether the house is tight or leaky. Okay. And maybe you could give a couple examples of some common places you overlook, because I know it's easy to you know, notice that your windows or your doors are leaky, but are there some places that people commonly don't think about? Yeah, one of the big areas that we target in our program is the attic access hatch. So up where you enter your attic, there's oftentimes big cracks or it, the, the panel doesn't fit right. So that's a, that's a big target area, especially because heat rises and wants to go up there and, and escape. Uh, the other area I would say is in your basement. Um, if you're looking up between the joists, you'll see the band joist area or sill box as it's sometimes called. And that can be a pretty leaky area too, so we seal that up well. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, my husband and I um, insulated our attic hatch, and we put a couple layers of that pink foam down, and then we took some um, weather stripping around the edges. So I guess that's what you're talking about with the air leakage, because it wouldn't matter if we did a great job with the insulation if we still had leaking around the edges that would all just go through there. Precisely. Yeah, that's exactly what we would recommend. Okay. Um, and what about uh, appliances? Do, you, do your services cover upgrading those? Yes, they do. We uh, primarily focus, we'll only focus on refrigerators, and we'll meter the refrigerator with a little handheld device that tells us how much electricity it's using based on a period of time. And if it's found to be inefficient, we can replace it. Mm -hmm. 
I've heard that 2001 is the year that maybe um, there were a lot of technology changes so that if your refrigerator is older than that, it's a pretty good bet that you could use upgrading. Um, and also, I guess, Energy Star logos, uh, those little blue mm -hmm. stars we should look for. Yeah, definitely. There's, uh, refrigerators are energy hogs, and it, the Energy Star logo makes it really easy to buy an efficient one. Okay. What about furnaces? Um, our program will look at furnaces in kind of two capacities. Is it operating safely, and is it energy efficient? Um, we don't want the furnace to be backdrafting or producing carbon monoxide, and we also don't want to see a, an ancient furnace that we know is just a real waste of energy, and we'll try to replace it on either of those counts. Okay. Well, it's good to know you'll replace it for safety reasons, because back like 30 years ago, we had a furnace that had holes in it, and we had carbon monoxide in our home, we didn't know it because it's colorless, odorless, and we didn't have a carbon monoxide detector. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big advocate of those now, those yeah, detectors. They're definitely good. However, you do have to replace them a little bit more often than smoke detectors. So. Oh, why is that? Oh, the sensors, are di they operate differently, and they just wear out more quickly. Hmm. Um, okay, so what other safety things might your program look at? Um, a big thing that we target are smoke detectors. We try to install a smoke detector in every single bedroom and on every level. Mm -hmm. And that can help a lot uh, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Um, we also go for uh, dryer vents, mm -hmm. uh, making sure the dryer vents have a nice straight run to the outside and that they actually go outside. You don't want all that moisture that's in your clothes being dumped inside your house. Uh, and also it's a gas appliance, so there's combustion byproducts that could be pumped into your basement or into your family room. Um, so that's not good. So we make sure that those are operating properly. I've heard they can be a fire hazard. Um, mm. Maybe the flexible tubing grabs the lint or something. Yeah, if, if, if there's places in the tube, if there's a kink or a pinch or something where lint can collect, then the heat from the dryer uh, has the potential to ignite that, which is not great. Yeah. All right. Well, I feel like we've gone over the basics of what you can do in a regular home. Now, how about mobile homes? Because I know that okay. there's special weatherization needs for mobile homes. Now, why is that? Mobile homes are, have a different type of, they're a different type of construction from regular site-built homes. They're generally thinner walls. Um, they're, they're made to be lightweight so that they can be transported. But that also results in poor construction quality, low insulation levels, and uh, that sort of thing, which they're small in size, but they can be poorly constructed and be expensive to heat and cool. Mm -hmm. And um, the movie that we're going to show uh, has a lot of emphasis on sealing the duct work, leaks in the ducts, and why is that? Well, if, you're, if your ducts work, duct work is falling apart, the heat isn't getting to where you need it to be in your bedroom or wherever. And also, underneath a mobile home in an area called the belly, if you get under a mobile home and look up, you'll see that the duct work runs under there. Now, it is insulated, but often that insulation has been ripped down, and um, the duct work is basically passing outside blowing the air outside for a second and then bringing it back in, so that's horribly inefficient. Hmm. Well, it's funny because you usually don't think of mobile homes as a place where we should be worrying about weatherization because they're so small. I mean, how much heating and cooling can it lose? Mm -hmm. But actually, I guess they're really important use of weatherization funds. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, so, they're, they're a good place for people um, to live in and that they're affordable, but if you, if you have a, an inexpensive home, but you're spending a fortune to heat it, we want to try to help with that. That's a good point. Now, according to the Bureau of Census, over 6% of Americans live in mobile homes, which equals about 9 million mobile homes in the U.S. Being some of our most poorly weatherized structures, that's a huge and preventable waste of energy for our nation. Take a look at the proper way to weatherize low-income housing in this video. Uh, we've been uh, working on this mobile home and uh, this particular mobile home uh, we found very low insulation levels and uh, in the belly for instance uh, that is the uh, floor system and we also found quite a bit of duct leakage uh, which we were then able to solve those duct leakage problems through blower door testing and pressure pan testing uh, diagnostics which enabled us to trace uh, where that duct leakage was 
and then uh, utilize a variety of techniques to seal it. He was just showing us different materials and, and basically what you need, you need a roll of flashing, um, you need some good UL approved foil tape, um, you need some mesh tape, but the, the key ingredient is that mastic because you can put all that other stuff in, but that mastic just kind of solidifies everything and, and adheres it all together and when that mastic dries it stays flexible um, so you don't have to worry because a lot of times when we go look at mobile homes right from the factory that foil tape that they use to seal the ducts it's already um, you know it's failed it, it kind of shellacks and it falls off and by using mastic we know it's just it's there to stay and that's real important in these mobile homes to make sure that what we do is, is there to stay. The thing that impressed me most was when they fabricated the, the booth. You know, he made a little extension, extend down in there, and then he wrapped it in the mastic. You know, that was that was pretty neat in order to seal it up, get a permanent seal on it, and he also rolled up the, the foil and blocked it off to keep the airflow from extending down to the other end. And then he also sealed that in mastic. I thought that was a pretty good idea. And it also reduced our um, CFMs by, like, I don't know, I think 50. It was with just that little bit. Whatever technique you need to use to get the job done you just want to make sure you have mastic foil tape mesh tape and just flashing with you that should just be a staple in your vehicle what I really liked um, was seeing the duct pressure diagnostics with the duct pan I think that's real beneficial and um, it'd be easy enough to make your own duct pan and start doing your own tests like that and I think that's what I'm gonna do as a result of this training because before you would just do a blower test and you wouldn't know where well we'd walk and we'd feel the air coming through the ducts and we we pretty much do mandatory duct sealing um, at the boots and stuff but by doing that duct pan testing we could seal the boots and it still tells us you know what before the end of that job, whether we got a, still got a problem, maybe internally, where we'll have to get into that belly and, and, and um, do some investigating. But that duct, it, it kind of showed us what area to start looking. Um, instead of going and just cutting holes anywhere under the trailer, you kind of, you got an idea where to start. And we insulated the belly uh, with fiberglass blown in insulation. And uh, the benefit there was that we reduced the uh, air leakage rate of the house by, um, probably at least 20 percent uh, because of the air leakage uh, reduction that we were able to quantify with the uh, uh, blower door and diagnosis. So a, a hole is drilled under the uh, mobile home uh, through the uh, panel under the mobile home they call the belly and uh, you push this up into the hole the material comes up and it gets diverted by this and shoots around so you just turn it like this around and you can go 360 degrees and fill the, uh, the cavity under the, under the home with insulation. You can see a cut area here uh -huh. that they would just push this up in there I see. and spin it around and blow it, blow it full of insulation okay. and then that's patched. Uh, we uh, attempted to access the wall cavity, which we did in certain locations on this home. Here we have a situation where we have uh, very low insulation levels, uh, about an inch of insulation, not even an R6. Uh, and what we'd hoped to do here was uh, pull back the siding and then re-insulate the wall using uh, bats of insulation, stuffing them up into the wall cavity. And in many mobile homes, that's a possibility. But in this case, you have two by two wall construction, and uh, which is vertical framing, and then you have uh, horizontal bracing that goes across, or down horizontally. So uh, you can't utilize this, that technique in this case because of the obstruction created by the horizontal strap. Also, there's really no practical way to re-insulate this cavity because it's already uh, too tight uh, or restrictive to be able to, uh, to blow it with a, a tube fill with loose fill insulation. So this is one we cannot do. We were able to demonstrate the sidewall application with the stuff it method where you take uh, a blanket or a bat of insulation and use a stuffing tool and uh, move the insulation up into the existing cavity by taking 
apart the, or, or removing the screws from the lower sill of the metal siding and then uh, which allowed us enough space to be able to use the stuffing tool to install a bat. How much insulation is here? Not very much, about an inch. If that. On the roof, uh, we were able to uh, demonstrate a couple different methods for accessing the roof cavity. One uh, with the edge lift method where we uh, went along the edge here and removed uh, the gutter material and unfastened the edge of the roof lip uh, and raised the roof lip and then we re-insulated the roof cavity. It was a fairly shallow roof cavity, uh, but we're estimating that we got an additional uh, R11 to R19 in that attic space. With the flexible insulation tube and do a 360 with the insulation coverage. And that works in a lot of cases, but not in this case. You know why? Because the bowstring trusses have solid gussets all the way through. So there's no way we can only, we can only get uh, each cavity. That way. So the thing is to walk away, but you walk away from that method. Instructor Bills lets us know that you know there's a lot of different ways that mobile homes are built, and sometimes you got a little creative to get the stuff in there, but you'll figure it out. There's there's a way to do it. Uh, the other method, of course, is what? Lifting. Edge lift. But what I would like to draw your attention to, since they've already cut two holes, is how they're going to patch this. So if you can get up on the ladder or take a look at how they're doing that, that's really important because you don't want roof leaks. So basically the way they're going to do it, they cut the 12 by 12 opening and they had a had a flap, basically, of the roof, and they just left, like, hinged over. So they're going to take that, bend it back over, okay, and they're going to put an oversized piece of sheet metal on top of that, but they're going to back caulk it first before they put it down with high temp. Should be polyurethane. That's the best caulk to use, not high temp uh, silica. Should be polyurethane. So they lay that down, and then they zip screw it all the way around, you know, every few inches. And then... He's got a material called peel or ice and water shield, and that works fine too. Ice and water shield is fine for this. Peel and seal is another type you can consider using. So once that's down, uh, then we'll put the goop to it. Okay, the roof, uh, the, the roof coating, uh, white uh, elastomeric. See the flashlight? Yeah, you just take the sun and you reflect it in there off your watch. And it's about the most powerful flashlight you can get. You could rapidly fill up the bathroom with uh, fiberglass insulation if you don't seal that off. Yeah, how did you know to look for that? Well, because I've been burned in the past. It's seal them tight and then ventilate right is the new uh, mode or the new paradigm, yep. the new philosophy. So 7.5 you know, CFM per person, and in order to get that, you have to ventilate. Fiberglass there, right through here, um, bar, the air is air an indication air. that it's yeah. acting like an air filter, and it's filtering out dirt. So dirt means that there's a lot of infiltration going on in that wall cavity, which is inherent uh, to uh, mobile home walls because they're ventilated. They're literally vented, ventilated. Basically, we put this, right here. If we put this back down a minute, see how this is ridged here. This is intentional so that when condensation occurs on the inside of these uh, these panels, the water will run out. Okay, so it is intentionally ventilated, <laughs> which is uh, an inherent energy problem for these guys. Well, most people have never even heard of weatherization. And, and the stimulus program really brought an awareness not only to weatherization, um, but these people that are being weatherized, they all attend energy education classes and stuff, and, and they learn how to adjust their lifestyles and stuff, too. It's not just a one-time um, savings. I mean, you're going to save for the entire time that home is being occupied. Okay, so uh, a couple uh, questions I have for you after watching the video. We didn't emphasize windows. Obviously, there's nothing in the movie about 
changing out windows. Now, why is that? Uh, window, windows can be a great place to save energy. However, they're very expensive to install. So if you were to spend $500 on a new window, that might be very uh, desirable home improvement, but it would take a long time for that $500 to be made up in energy savings. So um, it's something that we don't uh, focus on in our program as much as like we've discussed attic insulation and other types of improvements. And the gentleman at the end of the movie mentioned that uh, there are some things that people can do around the house that don't require any installation, no money whatsoever, mm -hmm. just behavior changes. Do you want to address some of those? Yeah, the, uh, the, the first and easiest one would be just to lower your thermostat a couple degrees. Uh, every time you lower your thermostat one degree, it, it equals about a 3% uh, savings in your utility bill, wow. or at least your gas furnace bill. That's a lot. Yeah, and you can also lower your water temperature a little bit so that uh, you run your run the water over your hand and you can keep your hand under it just barely that's about the right temperature um, safe for, for children too, oh, well right? yeah and the scalding you know that's important um, compact fluorescent light bulbs you know the little light bulbs that are spirally um, they're the price on those has come down substantially in the last couple years and so they're automatic energy saving each time you change one of those out Recently, I switched to um, detergent that is for cold water washing, and my clothes get just as clean as they did when I used warm water. Mm -hmm. So that probably helps. Um, I also uh, got rid of our second fridge, which was a little bit painful at first, but mm -hmm. I've since started using a cooler if I need to once in a while, like say we have guests over, and um, so that, that's helped. Yeah, and you also have a lot more room in your house now. Yeah, so. that's for sure. Those are big. Yeah, um, I feel like we've done a pretty good job um, of going over different behavior changes and uh, installation things that we can do. It's been a very helpful discussion, Erin. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So is there one more time you can give us the contact information of your program? Sure. Uh, give us a call at 734-544-2948. Uh, or uh, check us out online eWashtenaw.org, the county's website, uh, so eWashtenaw.org slash weatherization. Great. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to view this show online, go to eWashtenaw.org forward slash green room. Thanks for joining us here in the green room.